All right, so welcome to the Learning Technology Group. Uh, this is our session on designing media assignments. Uh, the Learning Technology Group is a ad hoc group of people through HUS, and I'm from the Center for Instructional Innovation. My name is Justina Brown, and we're all contributing to this conversation today because uh, we all support design of media assignments. Um, so we'll start with introductions and what you think you might be doing with media. Okay, should we start over here? Oh, go for hi. It. I'm Kevin Dixie. I'm an instructional technologist at Western. I'm also the Canvas administrator. Uh, I've been in media development and production for 30 years, almost 30 years. Uh, I used to work in an ad firm. I owned a media company in Seattle for about a decade, so I have a little bit of experience. Oh, you. All right. I'm AJ Barce. I'm also a technologist for ATUS. I've been around the block in media everywhere from podcasting to broadcast to publication to papering. It doesn't matter. Um, so I've got all that I can bring to the table. And I'm a teacher to boot, so I want to mesh them and present that to more instructors so that they have a better concept of both worlds, the media world and the pedagogy world, and tying them together. My name is Robert Clark, I'm the video services manager and I'm one of the go-to people on campus for video production. I too have also taught at a, at a college and university level media production, media theory and media history classes. Um, I'm very well versed with making video productions behind the camera and also assisting those that are trying to do their own work, especially academic work, in order for them to get the best quality product that they can provide given the resources they have at hand. Um, and I work under John Farquhar here. <coughs> John Farquhar. Hi. All these fine folks I try to help support. <laughs> <laughs> Talk yourself up there. Right? <laughs> Oddly enough, you're not included in that list, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there are some exceptions. Uh, some I'm numbers. Peter Ingrass. I work with Canvas training people mostly. And uh, welcome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jasmine Yang from Extend Education. Uh, until last year, I was a student employee. From this year, I'm a full-time employee. And I Great. am doing, thank you. I am doing more uh, social media to recruit international students for intensive English program. And I'm Ryder Banta, a library instructional design resident. And yeah, before coming to the library field, I actually worked in film and media production uh, in various contexts and now I'm just interested in okay what are the resources here how can I when I'm teaching a class how can I bring some media production stuff into that and, and you students the, make cool stuff and you have one of the coolest names in Korea yeah seriously do you know what my middle name is oh tell us Zygmunt ah oh, no yes. way my wow. blown <laughs> yes <laughs> If you ever want to get married, just let me know. <laughs> I'll, let my, I'll check it in with Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we can work something out. Yeah, the, the, the subtitle of this is Designing Marital Assignments, too. So you can work with Kevin on both. If you ever go into boxing, you want an announcer, I want to announce your name. And in this corner, Ryer Zygmunt Banta. <laughs> the battling librarian. OK, so that's hard to follow. <laughs> I'm Justina Brown, Center for Instructional Innovation and Assessment. I'm an instructional designer, and I've done a lot of video and graphics and web design, uh, both personally and professionally, and I've done some teaching. I teach a, a freshman class um, for the past 12 or so years, and so <clears throat> marrying the two is always of interest and, and seeing what works and what doesn't work. So that's what we're going to look at. So first of all, uh, what is media? Does anybody have any ideas? <laughs> Answer for me. Are we broadly defining it? Yeah. Well, what are examples? Well, I mean, it, it depends. It's it's really dependent on sort of what what context you're thinking of it in. I mean, you can be anything from, you know, leaflets to handing out, you know, standing there with a sign in your in your lab. To uh, you know, to a podcast or a, you know, a piece of video. You know, I think it's really context specific. And we should include social media in there as well, which is the interactions that people have that may simply be text, but often are photos. Or I mean, back in the day when I was in high school, I worked in the multimedia department, 
and we would cart over slide carousels. Yes. You know, remember the or remember the film strip ones? We go boop, you had to advance them, boop, you had to advance them again. It's the same thing. I mean, that was that was that was high technology back then. In my they elementary school, it, in my elementary school, I, I remember uh, mimeograph machines with the pre ply <laughs> paper, and trust me, that ink smell. Mm, oh yeah, yeah. It was the best. Yeah. So yes, there's a lot of definitions of media, but what we're talking about are the things that tend to be uh, used in assignments that are a little more on the, you know, what's modern. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have mimeograph up there. No, Surprise. no. Okay. And so uh, under we've got video, of course, photo essay. So using graphics and video, or I mean graphics and photos in different ways, uh, websites, and that includes. Uh, blogs and uh, what else? Uh, of course, uh, portfolios. Portfo yeah, e-portfolios, different ways of presenting materials online. <clears throat> audio, podcasts, and uh, other kinds of audio. Uh, graphic design and interactive pieces, so apps, uh, Kiosks that run by themselves, uh, mobile applications. <coughs> yes. I think you could. I think <coughs> this list. I think you could really narrow it down and say we're talking about media that's delivered through digital means. You know, where the yeah. delivery system is sort of some sort of computer, be it palm top, you know, tablet, desktop, laptop, whichever of, whichever of those it happens to be. But you are delivering this content digitally. Yeah. That sounds good. So on that note, uh, we are going to switch over to Peter talking about why uh, this is a, something we would use in a class. Yeah, that's right. Because you know, the, the point of the the project has to tie into the goals in class or what you're trying to get done. And I've seen a lot of media um, assignments over the years that have been uh, simply a practice of trying a new media, but didn't really tie into what the course was about. And I actually taught a few classes where there were um, people who were made to do programming, um, you know, and really didn't need to know anything about it. And it was complex. It was enough that it was really a pain for these people. And they were studying uh, instructional design at the time and, um, you know, totally didn't need to, need to take a programming class and do a whole project, which was sort of a... Uh, just, just seemed to me that it was way outside of what the whole um, program was about. Um, and this happens too with um, with media pro media assignments. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a faculty just just the other day about a media assignment where she was going to have people take pictures in the field and then come out come back and post them somewhere for everybody to look at. And she came in and she said, "I'm going to have them all do it in Facebook." And I said, "You know, you probably ought to go back to your class and ask them what they're using before you just decide." that they have to do something with something that requires an account and something they may not even be familiar with or use anymore. So she went back, came back the next week, and apparently none of her students use Facebook anymore. Um, wow. So uh, yeah, in class of, I think she said 25 people, none of them used Facebook. So when I asked her to find out what people used, I, I said, you know, ask them if they use Facebook and if they have before. And all of them had used Facebook before and had had accounts but weren't using them anymore. Um, so, uh, so the point of all of that was that it's important to ask your students what they're using to do projects in, um, I think, before you just randomly pick a tool and say, oh yeah, everybody uses Facebook, you know, just go out and assign a Facebook assignment. That would have been a real problem for her. Um, they had, like, closed their Facebook accounts and stuff. Um, so, uh, so what I did think was interesting, just as a sidebar on that, is that apparently the most used program for communication in her students anyway was um, Twitter. And even email was considered to be really old fashioned and only something you did in school. Um, so that's, that's just an interesting fact. Um, so here we were trying to find out or figure out, you know, if you're gonna assign an assignment that involves media, um, is the time that the students have to put into the project really worth it and is the project going to be meaningful enough to allot that kind of time? Because I know in a lot of classes, let's see, if you're taking, what is it, three or four units, 10 hours a week is what you're supposed to do outside of class. Is that correct? Is it three times the number of credits? 
Have you taken three credit cards? Uh, so three, nine for three, 12 for four. Nine hours that's two for one. Two for that's one. Double. At any rate, it's not a lot of time yeah. um, outside of class to work. And one of these projects could eat up almost all of that, you know, depending on what you ask. So if you go out and say create a, you know, 30 minute video, that could be all of their outside work. Um, so we're going to explore further these couple of questions at the end right here. Um, why the kind of media and is it feasible? And I think feasibility is really the huge question. Um, I know Robert and Kevin have both had situations where people in, assigned video projects late in the quarter and you know the goal was pretty much unattainable uh, and put the students through really a lot of trauma trying to get the project done. Um, so uh, there's kind of a lot to consider more than just you know picking a, a media and saying that looks cool I'll have all my students do it but you know it has to weave into all of this and take all of this in account. This is also a continuation of the feasibility. That's you. That's right. Good. <laughs> uh, so so here we go. Read the slide. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any questions, say so. <laughs> well, let me let me right. butt in and say that part of one of the we're not just dropping open ended questions in front of you. Part of the reason for us to be here and, and actually have jobs at Western is to provide faculty and, and staff resources in providing them direct experience on new software or trying to give them the benefit of our experience as far as how much is too much or too little and what software or hardware or services are available. And especially in conjunction with a lesson plan, like, you know, Peter or Kevin or others can, I, you know, identify interconnections or in certain cases can identify a better tool or a different tool that you hadn't thought of. And part of the goal that we have as a group is to find new tools that are out there that may not even be commonly known and test them and verify that they can work and then see if they're available, or I'm sorry, if they're interested um, by the faculty. Mm -hmm. I think, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, evaluating this kind of work is also kind of difficult and it brings up a whole question of, you know, uh, if you were to simply, let's say you were assigning a paper to be written, um, you know, do you count the words or do you look at the content? Um, if you're just looking at the quality of the video versus the content of the video, that, those are two totally different questions. And the, the quality of the video may have very little to do with what you're teaching. Um, you know, when I say the quality of the video, I mean technically, you know, is it broadcast quality? Does it, you know, fulfill all these various types of video needs? Um, and secondly, down there, it says, is there a rubric developed for this kind of work? And that would be really important to sit down and develop a good rubric for this and make sure you're measuring what you want to measure and not things that would come in, you know, just a general sort of viewing of the video um, type of rubric, but you're going to look for, did it, you know, cover the content that I wanted to address the questions that we had and, um, you know, so on and so forth. So I think that that's really important to have a grading scale and share the grading school scale with your students before you start the project um, so that they know which things are the most important to um, achieve in the project. What is the focal point of the project? Um, there's a lot to putting together a media assignment and it can be easily sort of sidetracked into simply about the media or the technology. Or how pretty it is. Right, or how pretty it is, right. And that none of that may matter at all. <laughs> well, another thing that I've seen is, is that like um, instructors really get wrapped around like we need to use this specific tool because this is the standard. Everybody needs to know this. Just to do something simple like, you know, I don't know, uh, make a picture brighter. You don't need to have ninjutsu skills in Photoshop to do that when there's like Pixelmator, you know. You don't need a $600 app to make something black and white. Um, or better yet, like you need to know Final Cut or Premiere to make a moving, you know, slideshow of still photos. You know, PowerPoint does the great, you know, does that just as equally good. And so trying to shift away from, yes, there is this great tool that everybody knows, but there's a whole bunch of easier tools, you know. You don't need to grab a sledgehammer just to you to tack in a nail into your wall, you know, just use a tack hammer. I think, too, that, that the emphasis on this, like it just pointing out, the emphasis is, is sort of, it's off, it's in the wrong place. Um, and it's in, it's, the emphasis has been on the tools for as long as I can remember. I was a beta tester for the first version of Photoshop, even going back to then. You know, companies sold their wares by saying, ooh, buy Photoshop and you will be fill in the blank. You will be a designer, you'll be a photographer, you'll be whatever. And software's been sold like that for as long as I can remember, you know, since the beginning. 
you know, oh, buy, buy Illustrator and it'll make you a graphic designer. When the truth of it is, the skill makes you that thing, right? Learning the skill. You know, you can't buy Photoshop and be a digital painter. You have to be a painter first. The painter is the important part, not the software. Software comes and goes. You know, I, it, I can think far back when I used to use a thing called Color Studio, and then it went away, and then, you know, Cork Expressed, and then InDesign, and back to page banker. It's like these tools are transitory. Some have lasted years, other ones have come and gone, even really good tools. But I think our emphasis for the last two or three decades has been on the tools. And the tools are not where the emphasis should be. It's like I cook, you know, so if I serve somebody dinner, they don't go, ooh, which pan did you use? No, pan does it, I cooked it on a slab of bone or something. It doesn't matter, all right? And we need to be focusing on what the skill is we want them to achieve. And that, that when we do that, then the tool is immaterial. And I think it wraps up in the way you do these, you'll do an assignment like this because let's say, um, uh, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah. You're a student? No. No. You're a prof? A uh, staff member. Okay. So let's say, Sarah, you get a, um, you get a, a, a chore to do and they want you to, you know, you, you need to go do some pictures and do this and put it in some sort of presentation. Okay. Well. I really, what the hell do I need to dictate how you do it? I don't need to. As long as you give me the thing that I want at the end of it, it really should be of no importance to me what tool you use. Unless the goal of the exercise is to make sure you know how to use Photoshop. If that's the goal, then yeah, go take some pictures, edit them in Photoshop, and put them in a PDF or something like that. If the goal of it is the end product, then I really shouldn't care at all what you use. You know, and it's, a, it's really of no importance because the, the thing I wanted you to do to achieve or to learn is the end product, you know, and the learning process in between. It, it doesn't matter. Like, like if you get homework now or you get a task to do at your office, they don't say, oh, make sure you use that, you know, rotring pen over there and the pink eraser. Don't use the white eraser. You know, why? What's the point of that? Where's the pitfalls? Oh, do pitfalls come next? <laughs> wow. Oh. <laughs> Me and my box of rage get to talk about pitfalls. Um, so there are a lot. I mean, we have, we, as long as I've been doing this, there are tons of things you run into. So number 10, students don't budget enough time and they panic. So I can tell you firsthand, and John can too, having been to the Student Tech Center, we've seen, we've seen the panic in students' eyes when they, they like, oh, I've got a 10-minute video to do, right? So a 10 minute video, Robert, you want to tell us how much sure. time to budget? So let's say you were doing a 10 minute interview. We were recording anywhere, it doesn't matter, probably somewhere on campus. You would probably spend about an hour, maybe two hours in the field recording that little 10 minute thing. You might end up spending less, but it's very likely that you would spend that much because it takes a while to set up the camera and the microphone and do all the stuff and then get 10 minutes. And it usually isn't 10 minutes, it may be 30 minutes that you edit down to 10 minutes. Later on, when you get to the editing phase, if you were aiming for a 10 minute video and you had 30 minutes of raw footage, let's say, you could easily spend 10 hours, one hour for each of the finished minute of video mm -hmm. in the editing process. Or let's say it's not a single person, but a variety of people, you could easily spend two hours for every finished minute mm -hmm. and thus having 20 hours of editing. And that's if you had no technical errors or, or and you knew what you're doing. You knew what you wanted to do, the, yep. the software functioned correctly, the hardware, and quite frankly, if you had access to that machine for 20 hours, which isn't always a given, especially near the end of the term when everybody's trying to do stuff. And so this particular 10 minute video with pre-production and production and post-production could take as much as 25 hours of student work to manufacture. Now. In certain classes, that's just fine. If you build that into the class, you say 25 hours, that's, that's an assignment. But it's where the last two weeks of the term come in and maybe they don't have access to the equipment or they don't budget their time correctly and so they just wait until the last minute. But in either case, that 25 hours becomes almost insurmountable. And I've seen Kevin and, and John have two people pulling all-nighters in the old STC especially, but on other computer labs on campus even now to make sure that they finish it in time for whatever the uh, deadline is. I had a student come in one time and they said, oh, can you help me with this? Sure, what do you need? I have to produce this video. Okay, we'll get you set up. Uh, and it had to be a 10 minute, no, it was a 30 minute video. Okay, I, you know, have you shot any of the stuff? No, I hadn't shot any of the stuff. All right, so I started to go through that. I said, by the way, what time, when, when's it due? 
and it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. Let's do it five. I laughed so hard to leave. And then I saw their crushed face, and I said, I'm so sorry. And I laughed again because it was so hilarious. It's just there's nothing you can do at that point. You're like, wow, you know what? Yeah, you're your host. It ain't going to work. Sorry, bye bye. You know, and you really feel, feel bad for them. But, you know, budgeting enough time, and that's, there's twofold making sure the student knows how much time it takes, and making sure the faculty knows so they can pass it on. Um, the instructor doesn't realize how long it will take to watch or evaluate the project. I have seen this many times. They'll get, uh, they'll get like 20 or 30, or I'll have a big class of 100, and they'll get like 100, uh, you know, 20 minute videos. And then I'll get a call. Is there some way I could do this faster? No, you're not. You can't. You have to watch them. I mean, like I budget. I make students do a, uh, um, a at the end of my class in the fall. I make them do it. I don't make them. I have them do a final project, and it's usually videos what they choose. But I just dispense with it. That's the final. They come in. They have to show it to me, and I grade it right there <laughs> because I know I'm gonna have to spend like three hours or more watching them. So might as well make it a big party. I buy pizza. They come in, they show them to me, and they go, thumbs up. Yeah, great. You're done. Because otherwise, you leave, and then you're suddenly like, oh my god, I gotta spend three or four hours watching this stuff. You know, it's just, it's, it can be onerous unless you're prepared for it. So one is just, yeah, how long? And, and really, I have had that question, can I speed through it? Uh, fast forward, I guess, on the end, see, but you can't hear anything, you know. Is there a way I can, they want me to somehow condense it for them? Like, it can't be done. Sorry, you just got to spend the time to do it. There's a, there's a phrase in video or audio even called real time. And mm -hmm. so in certain circumstances, if you're watching a 10-minute thing in real time, it's going to take 10 minutes. Yeah. And if you had 100 student projects that were each 10 minutes long, it's 100 times 10. So there's 1,000 minutes and mm -hmm. I don't know, how many hours is that? A lot. A lot. And the goal is arguably... You know, it's just like skipping paragraphs in an essay or something else. I mean, if you're going to give the student your best grading and critique, you may actually watch it twice. I mean, back in the day when I was teaching, I would oh, yeah. watch it twice or individual parts of it mm -hmm. two or three times just to see if they were doing something wrong or right. Yeah. And then that just doubled or tripled the amount of time per assignment. And it depends what you're grading for. If you're grading for the thing, if you're grading for them, their ability to make the movie, then you have to watch it slowly and check out stuff. If you're just grading for content, even that requires a couple like, okay, did they cover the themes I wanted or whatever the parameters of the project were. So you know, you got to commit the time to watching the final projects if that's what you do. And that just means knowing ahead of time, all right, I got to block off, you know, a weekend day or something. And the bigger the project, I would say, uh, the more checkpoints there yep. should be. So well, that you have a, an approved storyboard before mm -hmm. they even start mm -hmm. on the or well, and you should also, like, I've seen faculty say, well, I want them to make, like, a 30-minute documentary. And I was like, what, are you nuts? Are you sure? You know, 300 people in your class. It's going to take you a week to watch those. And they're like, oh, yeah. How about three minutes, you know? Yeah. It's like, just to get them to understand, because they don't sometimes understand, well, I can sit down and watch 30-minute documentaries. I can drink coffee. Yeah, but you're going to watch 312 of them. Is that what you want? You know, so, yes, yeah, to be clear with them so they understand what they're asking and what they're going to get. You know, it's like ordering the large at those restaurants where the large is really this big, and you're like, oh, I can't eat that. Same thing. Um, the next is instructors have no previous experience in which to evaluate the project. And, and this has always been a pet peeve of mine, because it's like, if you're an instructor and you, you, you order your, you have your students do a tech-based, technology-based project, it really needs to be something that you have some experience in, or that you at least conceptually understand. You know, it's like, otherwise you have no basis to really Graded, and I have seen this before. I've seen. I saw an English teacher one time gave their students an InDesign project. It was a writing class, but the, the entire project, because I helped a lot of students with it, was really all about laying the page out, and it had nothing to do with the class. And I talked to the professor. I go, I don't, I don't know any of that stuff. I don't even know how to work that program. And it's like, well, it's going to be tough for you to grade this because what are you looking for? You know, well, I want to make sure they did it right. Well, how do you know they did it right? Well, can't you tell me? No, because that's, I'm not grading the class. I can tell you what I've done, but it's like, it just created this distance, you know, and I think I had to really talk them through that and say, I think either you need to be brought up to speed on what's going on, or maybe, maybe rethink what it is you want them to do. So I also advise fa faculty, 
keep within your knowledge zone. And if you want to do something, go out and learn it. That's why we're here. We're here yeah. to help them do that and learn how to evaluate and learn how to understand it. And you, it's like, just like you don't need to know how to build a car to, to appreciate a car, but you at least conceptually should probably know how it works. You know, oh, the wheels move and there's put gas in and it starts up. So at least give people a working knowledge of the project and what they're doing with it. And one of the resources that all of us on this half of the table provide, and, and Justina, sorry, is um, either one-on-one -on -one or small group sure. or, or class space Or consulting. Or consulting. consulting beforehand. I mean, you know, most of the things that you're going to come up with as a faculty or staff person, we've at least touched and worked on a little bit, but in many cases we're very familiar with. And so, you know, like AJ goes to classrooms and does training, or, or, or Kevin and, you know, uh, Peter do as well, and Justina works on many faculty projects one-on-one, -on -one, and I've worked a lot with faculty to help them not only identify what skills they need to, excuse me, they need to learn, but also providing some of that training directly to ourselves, or at least pointing to lynda.com, or other training tools that we have available for certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, this is, uh, John, I'll turn this over to you, since this is something you see a lot of. Um, but it's basically the assignment just exceeds what we're capable of providing in terms of resources <coughs> on campus. Because one, students may not have access to the, they may not, may not own the tools to be able to do this project. So you need to be able, you need to be able to create the project that's something they can do with that, with a reasonable amount of effort, but not, oh yeah, you need to buy that, you know, $1,500 music editing suite in order to be able to make this work. Yeah, I'd recommend that if you're just starting off on a new assignment that requires media, that you consult with one of these folks or Gary Malik at our uh, equipment loan pool to find out what is the most appropriate equipment that your students would be using mm -hmm. during the production phase, and then also what labs on campus might have the software that you would well, recommend. When they're open. For post-production. <coughs> yeah. Understand the availability of this equipment. And to make those recommendations to your students as well, saying, okay, this is the equipment that I would recommend that you use, uh, and, and this is the availability, this is how much, how long the equipment you can check it out for, for example. Some of it's just four hours, some of it's 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have all that <coughs> arranged up front and provide all that information to your students. And that resource pool, which is, generally speaking, a finite resource of computers or hardware or software or whatever, shrinks incredibly near the end of the term, especially the end of spring term, mm -hmm. where everybody's doing their final projects, their senior capstone projects, what have you, yeah. and subsequently everything is checked out, all the cameras. Right. And all the hardware that's upstairs in the STC or, or computer labs, that's where you see people with little camp stoves and sleeping bags and, you know. They certainly do reach 100% capacity at times. Sure. Yeah. So if you've got a large class, it's critically important to consult with us to find out what the best, best Procedure would be. I mean, you can. You don't have to require fancy equipment. You can have people use their phones to record yeah. things on. Yeah. You don't have to require the the uh, the editing booths. Right. Uh, you can require some simple software that's available on most computers. Yeah. Or and for instance, you give them a time frame that they have this done, where they're not meeting the other crunch time periods as well. For instance, an example of this would be if students are doing video. One of the things they commonly need is to have like some sort of little external hard drive because they're going to capture footage. The way the lab and classroom computers are set up, if you were to capture the footage onto that computer and then log off, you're, you're not guaranteed it's going to be saved. So you want to save it to some sort of drive so you, you don't lose your footage, because that would be pr catastrophic. So great, they can go check out you know, a little external hard drive from classroom services. We do have a bunch of them, but it's not an infinite supply. So you get a big class you know, of, say, 100. Well, that might eat up the entire supply, so you might get to the point like, okay, I'm ready, I need this, and there's not a drive to be had, you know. So just the questions beforehand will help solve that. We can say, oh, yeah, remember, there's only, you know, 100 of these or 200 of these, and there are everybody else is going to be going for these. So it's just, just understanding things like that. The good news is that in the near future, if not already now, things like iPads will not only shoot video but edit it, and your higher-end iPhones will, and so in many cases, the students have access to tools that they weren't aware of that are either low cost or free that they can use to provide basic assignments to you without necessarily using equipment provided by the university. And that frees up a lot of, of capacity, especially in the last two weeks of a term.
Well, and that's what I said about not not specifying the tool. The tool is, the, is not the important part. Uh, number six, instructors include the assignment without first consulting WDA resources. Take it away, AJ. Yeah. I'm trying to oh, share yeah. the love. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, really. Uh, I think we've just mainly stated that. I, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. we're, you know, the resources include the people here, but also Gary Malik, who's in charge of classroom services, uh, Sherry Kaufman, who does lab scheduling for ATOS labs, maybe Rob Galbraith, who helps design mm -hmm. and monitor those labs. In other words, there's a, a group of people at ATOS that cover as many different resources as possible, up to, you know, network bandwidth, even, mm -hmm. if, if that was an issue. And the other thing I would add to that is, like, instructors, I mean, we have some instructors that kind of go and blaze trails. They, they grab new resources and implement them without consulting us, you know, and it, that's great. If you find a new tool, you know, have us kind of vet for it. Like, you know, we can, we, let us break it first before you try to implement it because it's easier for us to, you know, repair things as opposed to you already implementing it in five weeks in your course, mm -hmm. it fall flat because the resource that you selected isn't compatible or whatever. Also, if we know about it ahead of time, it's easier for us to support stuff. If somebody comes in with a tool none of us have seen and they want support on it, you know, dad, you know, we're very limited the amount of stuff we can do to something we have no idea what it is. Like, oh, I've been using this. Okay, awesome. Well, sorry, but none of us know that. You know, so and it takes us time to get up to speed, so it just may not be, it may not be helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> the instructor has no experience with the media involved. I think this goes back to, though, when we talk about them also not understanding it. It's like, you know, I, I really believe that in, in order for somebody to, to, to require some sort of media as part of an assignment, you should be experienced with it. Just like, you know, if, I, if I'm teaching a class in technology, you know, I'm not going to give homework that's like, uh, I want you to go home and make a pair of earrings. You know, like, something I don't know anything about. It's like, I just have no basis for be able, being able to assign something unless I have some, some skill. It's just like if you teach, uh, I don't know, geography, you know, the first assignment isn't going to be, you know, particle physics. Now it's going to be geography. You're going to kind of stick to your what you know. <laughs> Skills required of the assignment have nothing to do with the learning objectives of the course. That's awesome. You know, we have all seen this. We've all seen this because technology, how do I put this? Technology is very attractive. People want to, ooh, let's have them do a, a website. And for a while, do a blog. That's like the big buzzword. And it's great. These are all, they're all cool things. Does it really connect with your class at all? Is it really relevant? You know? You know, you got to really think about it. just just because it's cool doesn't mean you, you need to assign it to whatever you're doing. It really needs to have a purpose. You know, we used to joke in the old, in the old days when I was in uh, website development early on about the designers who design like a logo top for your website. And it would be like some rotating ball of flame, and you'd be like, "What's that? Isn't it cool?" Well, yes, it's cool. What does it have to do with? You know, anything that we're talking about. Oh, but I used this animation program. I don't care. <laughs> and I can get the ball of flame out of there. It's not supposed to be there. And, you know. and, and if I can butt in, this is a common problem with video production assignments in general. I mean, the students will find that any editing software has special effects. Uh, wipes and growing key and all that nonsense. And you're, you ask them to do a basic assignment, and you say, okay, I want you to go out and do this interview. And all of a sudden, there are dragons flying behind them, and they're on yeah. the surface of Mars or something like that. Well, if all you were doing was getting a very basic news piece on, you know, the children's hospital down the street or something, having it be on the surface of Mars with the dragons really doesn't fit in. Even if you can do it, doesn't mean it, it really makes sense to the video or makes it effective. Yeah. And and I think Peter and, and and Justina especially work really hard with faculty and staff to help identify how Whatever this thing is, is, is either adding to the effectiveness, ideally, or perhaps subtracting from it in a nice politically correct sort of way, where you can take that as advice and you know, do with it what you will. But certainly, um, one of the challenges that Western has is we don't really teach video production per se. We have classes throughout, you know, there's like uh, Mark Miller's class in Fairhaven and Calm, and there's a theater arts class, and then Art journalism. Journalism. But all of those are basically teaching it in conjunction with something else, such as video journalism or uh, dance. You know, there's a course in dance that teaches it for dance choreographers. 
So there really isn't a video production class as such. Subsequently, the learning objectives normally are not video specific. They're more content specific, mm -hmm. with video sort of as this medium to make it happen. You also, and, oh. and, and if it were the other way around, then you might ask for a chroma key and other nonsense like that, just to prove that they can do it. You also run into a problem, which I have seen up close, is that students are very eager to do these projects, and they're really willing, really willing to jump in and really put a lot of time into it. So you have them do a project, and I saw it was a student uh, several years ago. They were doing a website, and they put like their heart and soul into this website, used Dreamweaver and did all these special things and learned how to do this JavaScript stuff. It was beautiful. Had not, the content was, there was nothing there. It was completely bare and empty of anything that the professor wanted. The site was beautiful, but they failed because they spent all their time learning Dreamweaver and learning all this web stuff instead of focusing on the content because that's really where the assignment was. So, you know, I think that's the risk you run when people get caught up in it. Like, they'll make this cool movie, but it really doesn't meet the objectives of the class or the assignment. The assignment exceeds the student's skill. Um, this happens a lot. Uh, where you give an assignment where, kind of like what Kevin touched on, like you give a 30-minute documentary um, for something where you're just talking about storytelling, like, you know, doing a, some, something simple as um, showing a plot. There's the student that comes in, you know, they're thinking, okay, I'm taking an English class, and now they have to do a 30-minute documentary. There's kind of a disconnect. And so whenever you're assigning an assignment, you really want to figure, like, you know, kind of like Peter said, you know, do they use Facebook? Like, what are the skills that they bring, and what are some of the technologies that they're used to? Um, and then the flip side of that is, is that I kind of see it coming, coming and going. The students come in as English students, and they're they're going to, you know, be professional writers, and they're going down this track, and all of a sudden, thirty minute documentary that has a whole bunch of technical skills, and there has to be coordination, and you know, for an intro level class. And meanwhile, the professor is also thinking, well, this is going to be a drop in the hat. Like everybody knows how to do film, you know, I see it all the time. Or those students all know this. Digital stuff. This digital yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the younger generation. And see, back in the day when I was teaching video on a in a in a college, I would teach video editing in let's say three three hour sessions with lab assignments over a four week period. I mean, it would literally take up a month to you know have the do have them do assignments and assess the assignments and then go back and do it again and learn all the different skills and and whatnots that are a part of editing. And in most cases, the classes that the Student Technology Center provides are an hour, an hour and a half long. Maybe they come in two parts, beginning and advanced, so there's a total of three hours of education. And so the level of skill ability, I'm so sorry, the level of skill learning resource in these tools isn't necessarily as high as it would be, again, if they were taking this as a full-on class yeah. or even as a, as a series of like workshops or what have you. And then the other part of that is, that even after you learn all, all the buttons, it's just like learning how to drive. I mean, it took me years of experience to actually edit to where I could do it without thinking about where the buttons go, and then focus on the content. Mm -hmm. Previously, I had all I could do to, you know, just like driving the first time, sitting there going 30 miles an hour, watch for ten pedestrians, two. 10 and 2, speed cushion, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. Now you drive with a whiskey in one hand and a cigarette in the other. That's only you can. Oh, that's me. Uh, yeah, sorry. But the other thing, the flip side of this that a lot of people don't talk about is, yes, as geeks, we see it as it's technology, it's tools and stuff. But once you get the flow going and once you have this idea, it's an art. You know, these, you're, you're not just teaching these students to use these tools to make something that is, you know, just for your class. It's, it's an art form. You know, they're actually making a vision come to reality. Well, yeah, I get, the, I get this a lot sometimes when I teach Illustrator. Like, oh, it's so easy for you. Like, well, yeah, I was a professional designer for 10 years. I use this every single day, you know, 8, 12, 14 hours a day. Well, yeah, of course I know it well. Like anybody who knows something that they use a lot, I'd say, well, it's going to look easy for them. But, you know, it's not. It's, it's a skill, like any other skill. Um, so I mean, <laughs> the assignment exceeds time available in class, i.e. takes place in the last two weeks of the term. This is really just a scheduling thing. If you understand how much, how, what kind of um, resources it takes, what kind of time it takes, just make sure it's appropriately scheduled in the class. You give people enough time to do it. You know? That involves talking to us. It involves us you know, letting us say, oh, well, let's see what, what the availability of the resources are. 
And John, oh. John found oh. a couple of resources that I will share that, that are video uh, or <coughs> uh, media calculators. And it's nice, one of them, if you say what kind of project it is, um, a start date and a due date, and then it gives you a sheet that has what you should be doing when uh, as a general guide and all the pieces that might be involved in that kind of project. Yeah, and the other nice thing is that Gary Malik's scheduling per term for equipment resources goes through the end of the term Yeah. at the beginning of the term. So for example, if, if you knew as a student or if you assigned as a faculty person, okay, in week six, I want you to take camera X and, do, and go do assignment Y. The student on the very first day of class could show up at Gary Malik's office and say, okay, I need this piece of equipment for week six. <laughs> or you as a faculty person could contact Gary ahead of time and say, all my students are going to come in and asking for a blah. Do you have enough blahs for everybody, first of all? And if so, can I check them all out for my students or something? But anyway, what we try to do is make those sort of arrangements as much ahead of time as possible, frankly, to avoid the heartache and pain of telling a student no or watching their face fall when you say, well, you can't do it in five seconds or whatever. Um, the last one, and this is really, this is just, Anybody who works with technology knows sometimes it just doesn't work, you know, yeah. for a number of things. You got to be flexible. You know, I, I, I remember years ago, this was like 20 years ago, I was doing a project for Boeing. We designed a kiosk for them, and they delivered all these laptops that they wanted to have the kiosk information loaded on. We had tested it, it worked great, it was beautiful. They delivered these laptops, and we'd had a prototype laptop, which was great, so we were testing on that. But the real ones arrived, they were from Dell. We loaded the first one on, it would like poof, shut down because it would overheat, and we found out that we had to put it in the refrigerator to get it to work. It worked in the fridge just fine, but it was too hot, and it would shut down. We had like, I don't know, six hours left to go. All we had to do was load it on them and ship them out, not a single one worked, right? There, you just come to this crossroads. Yes, you, you feel like you have an aneurysm that's just gonna blow the top of your head off, and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this didn't work. You just gotta find flexibility. In that case, Boeing was great, and they said, fine, we, we get it. We'll ship you a new batch. Just get them out as quickly as possible. We'll pay for air freighting them all over the world. Great, fantastic. Sometimes, as the as the person expecting it, you just got to be flexible. I've emailed teachers before. We had a, a student come into the student tech center one time years ago, and they were with the design department, and they had this beautiful poster they had made, and they'd used Illustrator and they'd linked all their graphics in, but they hadn't embedded it in it, and they left all their graphics on their computer in their in their dorm, and it was due at five, and they had a, an appointment to print it and it was 4.45, and they were just up. They opened it up, all the graphics are gone, and I swear, I heard the scream from the other room, and I walked in, yeah. and it's just like having a complete meltdown. I said, what's okay? And I oh, my God, he's swearing. And I, grr, grr, grr. I sat down, I said, what's the matter? And he, oh, I'm gonna die, but blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I got on the phone, I called, the, I called the instructor, I said, here's what's going on, it's just a technical glitch. Is it okay? Oh yeah, no problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was great. He said, "Yeah, what's the problem?" I said, "Yeah, he's gonna go back. He has to get some graphics for him. It was really just a technical error. Don't. It's not his fault. The instructor was fantastic. And they understood completely. And of course, the student came down. Their blood pressure dropped. You know, a hundred <laughs> points after they just almost stroked out on me. And and it was okay. But you gotta be flexible, especially when you're when you want anything technology based. Sometimes things don't work. I and mean, we've all seen it. I've got my movie here." The drive doesn't work, or whatever. It's all happened to us, and we've seen it happen to other people. And, and one of the things, again, that we can provide from our knowledge base is a little bit of, like, if you as a faculty person came to us and said, student X turned this thing in late, and you said it was because of a computer failure, we can verify that, yes, it wasn't because they waited until the last minute or were hungover yeah. Or, yeah. or whatever, that we actually were having a computer failure or we've been having problems with the iPads or whatever. Yeah. And in many, many cases, that's the thing I've tried to do with my students. I've tried to let them off the hook because when they're brand new and learning any technology, they think that whatever goes wrong is their fault. Yeah. And in many, well, not many, but in, many, in some cases it isn't. It has, you know, networks down or the software, the update is bad, or the patches are bad, or blah, 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 blah. And it has nothing to do with them. And in fact, we're looking to them as the canary in the coal mine to tell us that there's something wrong, like with the printing or sure. other software that goes on on campus. And in any case, there's always these challenges. And it's not always the student's fault, and we try to let them off the hook when we know that. And then let you know, so that way as faculty, you can say, OK, well, nobody's going to turn in their large format printing assignment because we forgot to buy more paper. or 
the computer wasn't working or whatever. Or the yeah. large format printer explodes. Yeah, whatever. I mean, there's always, there's, there's usually somebody like one of us trying to fix it if we're aware of it, or else we're just finding out about it just as you're getting aware of it as well and then trying to fix it. So, anyway. And I think that also goes back to what something Justina mentioned is, is that you know if you build in checkpoints with your students, then they have redundancy baked in. Like they they're not putting it off to the end where it's just like oh I'm just going to rush and get it done. Mm -hmm. You know uh, I had a student where they did everything right. They they did it on our computer. They backed it up to a hard drive. They had the final product on a USB. They go to class and I was invited to the screening of it. They plug in the USB. The USB pops. It's dead. They go back to their hard drive, the hard drive won't boot up. We had to go back all the way to the original machine, re-render it. Meanwhile, just like Kevin mentioned, I told the professor exactly what's going on. She rolled with it, not a problem. Yeah. Re-rendered it and managed to get that group of students back to their class so they could get to the screening and get their final grade. You know? And the only reason why that happened is, is that she had a checkpoint at midterm. They had that midterm backup that they could carry forward. That's us. So really the, the Teaching, Learning, and Technology Faculty Development Office is the umbrella uh, over the ATUS uh, <coughs> Video Services, the Student Tech Center, uh, the Center for Instructional Innovation and Assessment, and uh, the Campus Support Team. So uh, did I miss anybody? <laughs> hey, we're not on there. What's up? What? Well, he's the umbrella. Well, oh. right? Umbrella's here. <laughs> He's, the, he's the, the thing that holds the umbrella pieces together. That's right. He's the glue that holds the bread together. So uh, we all are involved here and can help and support any projects that come along at any point, preferably earlier than later. <laughs> there you go. Do you have any questions? Are there any other slides? No. Uh, negative. Negative. Do you have any questions? Any things you'd like us to ask us or sure. like to rage at us, if you will? We're good either way. Yeah. We didn't get a chance to hear your introduction. <laughs> yeah, sorry, so right. all, uh, Sarah Jerns. I work in uh, teacher education outreach programs. It's kind cool. of a big name. So we manage programs off campus for people with teacher certification. And I came because uh, since we're at the kind of community college, it's almost like iPads are now just hitting them, and that's the hot new thing. And yep. everyone wants me to to get them tons and tons of iPads all the time. <laughs> so that's it. We're working on a project right now to get five iPads per site, but I'm kind of overseeing that and seeing all the challenges that's bringing up and then letting those out into the world. Yeah. Talk Come to talk to me. me. I will. Yeah, I, and I've been talking to like Greg. He's been yep. great and Paula and everything. But um, Yeah, and um, several of us have actually been playing with the idea of using iPads as a, using it as a creation tool and as a tool. How to, mm -hmm. How does it dovetail in? Where does its where is its place in the sort of spectrum? Yeah, you need to be careful too if these are iPads that you check out for a period of time and students return them, and you're asking them to do media assignments on them. They may very well turn the iPad back in with media yeah, exactly. captured on there that you want to make sure that you clear out. Yeah, well, and that's going to be an obstacle is that we're going to have is we're not going to be able to check in with them every time they get turned back in just because they're they're out there. So these iPads are just going to be coming back to our campus once a quarter. And it, it's sort of been working out. I guess Everett already has about yeah. seven iPads out there. And I think it's just kind of an honor system. And when they do check them out, we're going to have them sign an agreement. Like if you do leave personal information on here, you're responsible for all of that. So. Well, one of the challenges with media video assignments, especially is a you know, 64 gig iPad I don't know, how many minutes of video do you think that would hold at low res? Uh, uh, two well, hours. Yeah, I was going to say, right, well, high res is about two hours. Oh, didn't you say low res? I said low res. Oh, high res, uh, 64? 64 gig? Oh, on the camera on the iPad, you're right, because yeah. yeah. it's not that no, high res, yeah. yeah. Well, the point is that for teacher evaluations, they're usually recording an entire class, and that could easily be an hour. And so, you know, even at low res, what, you're talking maybe three classes, sure. or four classes at the so. most. Yeah. But then they have to be downloaded because otherwise nobody else is going to have space in them in the mm -hmm. future. Well, also, too, I mean, I think one of the, the secrets to me, the secrets of making an iPad work, is that iPads aren't, a, they're not a be all and end all. They work with, they work in conjunction with a variety of services. When they do work with services, things like Box and Dropbox and things like that, where I have access to my material, I have access to my content, 
then it became a lot more viable. You know, it's like, yeah, I can take tons of pictures, but it has them automatically upload to Dropbox, and I have 100 gigabytes of space there. Or I got 50 gigabytes on, on Box, and I can send video up there. So I'm not depending on anything being here. All my documents are somewhere else. So if this gets you know, sat on by an elephant, well, fine, I can still get to my stuff on my phone or somewhere else. So this becomes, in a way, it's like a dumb terminal, you know, connected to a vast system. That's where these really excel. They're smart, they're fast, they have a lot of controls, but I can also connect, they're connected. Okay. And that's when they become really powerful. So Can you configure it so that the default storage place for the photos is in Dropbox or some other? You can cloud? configure your Dropbox so it automatically pulls the photos there. Yeah. But so you need, but you you can need internal storage in some, some of the apps. Yeah. Some of the apps can be configured automatically to link with it. Yeah. Um, just think about the media. So just using the camera. The media is always going to be stored locally on the device. Yeah, yes. it can also be then, you can have Dropbox set up so it also comes well, up there. copies of it. Right. But only right. after you hit stop on the recording, for example. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if the app crashes, you know, and it doesn't have any cache, then it dumps. The other thing that I would say to that is, um, and I've, I've mentioned this to Paul as well, mm -hmm. is that if they have 64 gigs of raw footage, mm -hmm. it's going to take a long time to get yeah. that off yeah. via Wi-Fi. Yeah. yeah, especially off campus where the Wi-Fi isn't as robust yeah, yeah I think they have issues with that too. So th I was just thinking about that. Am I going to be checking them out with the cords or not? Because yeah. I, I don't know if they check them out right now with the cords. I almost I don't want to actually because we're hoping to leave them in like a mobile charging station, mm -hmm. and so the cords would just stay in there. Right. So that's a that's a great point. But, you you know, may. I, oh, sorry. I'm, 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 what, <laughs> what you may have to do to verify this is, is fill one up with video and go out in the field and, and try it on a low or medium level Wi-Fi connection because uh, your results may vary. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a big fan of using the, the little uh, USB adapters for the iPads. Mm -hmm. I've been using them for a while and you can pull, you can, you, can not, you can put stuff on it but you can also use it to come off the cameras and then, then the process, you need to come up with a process, getting stuff on here and then syncing it to something before it comes back and just getting them in that habit. Here's what you gotta do. Use it, put stuff on it, but you gotta sync it before it, come, before it comes back. Then they have then they have everything you need. Then it becomes really useful. Then it's like, you know, yeah, it's this transfer, you can hook anyone up or but, but in but in the use but in the multiple use, a very important thing is let's say the student, you know, is handing it off to the next student at five, so they record right up to five and then try to sync it. It's not going to sync no, no very quickly. It's going to take X amount of time, depending on how much video you shot and the width of your bandwidth, and that has to be figured in, or else the next student isn't going to be able to use it. Yeah, sure. and then we're also just using them for like apps, like kid-friendly apps too. Sure. I think that's oh, what they're looking for a lot too. Is they want to like take it into a special education like setting and no, utilize it. That. Yeah, really but I don't know. It's hard because I don't I don't visit Bremerton or. Every very often, <laughs> I know. So some kind of Java, you know, description of what to do when you get it. What yeah. To do when you be, yeah. write on it would be good. Yeah. So exploring. Hmm. All of our, I'll probably be talking to you about it. I've been talking a lot about it. So they're coming. They've been ordered. They're popping Which out. version do you know? We're doing the iPad Air 64 gig. We're going all the way, <laughs> which I'm really excited about. Right for about yeah. a year. <laughs> I know. Nine months. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.